Hey, y'all. <laughs> Welcome to our mailbag. Uh, this is the cut office. Here, I, here we are. This is my messy ass desk. <laughs> All right, should we just begin? We thought we'd take this opportunity just to respond to some of the comments that we've gotten over the months. We really love it when you guys comment, even if you're throwing shade. I think it's great that we're inspiring informed debate. Okay, so this is a comment from Adonis Bathius. Adonis wrote, I only come to this channel to watch your 100 years of beauty videos. I like seeing the ideals of beauty around the world, but my God, y'all really like to push your agenda wherever you can. So first of all, if you're watching a video of beauty ideals around the world, you are watching literally a collection of people's political agendas. We've gone through the ages in the archives and we've included protesters. We've included IRA terrorists. We've included guerrilla warriors. And so you can't really say that the 100 Years of Beauty Project can ever not have a point of view or a political agenda. Second, I'd like to just um, challenge all of us to think about how every time anybody says anything in this goddamn world, it's already political. There's no a political statement that any one of us can make. Two people sitting around and talking about the weather already contains with it a kind of aesthetic and a kind of politics. Okay, what else? Okay, this is from Jabber Maki. I wish Mr. Chan would do a thousand years of beauty in this format, 5,000 or even 10,000. Yeah, I think it would be really fun to do that. There's a couple um, practical problems that I think we'd need to work out to be able to do it. One is to think, okay, what is a discrete political or cultural entity that has actually survived a thousand years or five thousand years. Even when we're talking about something like ancient Egypt or Han China, right, those borders become very difficult to delineate over the course of millennia. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, you know, we could do like a thousand years of Cairo or five thousand years of Cairo, we could do five thousand years of Shanghai, those things would be interesting too. So the sky is really the limit on that. If you, anybody has ideas for how we could approach that, we're totally all ears. But I would just love to see when art, the art historians and the artists are commenting on our videos. They, these are people that are thinking through aesthetics already. They're already imagining how the world is produced and constructed visually. So we need you guys commenting more. Because some of these other fools just do not get it. All right, what else? Chan is super bitchy. This is half Chan. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so this comment comes from Burnt Ice Slushy. Can you do a video of the 100 years of science with female scientists of the decades, or maybe 100 years of sci-fi with different media's interpretations of what fashion in the future will look like? So those are both great ideas. So I'm an anthropologist of science and technology. I'm actually really interested in how science and technology are produced socially and culturally. When you study science and technology, of course you must acknowledge that it's been a completely patriarchal project and that when women are contributing, they get erased out of the narrative. So I'd really, really love to do 100 Years of Beauty of women in science and tech. But the problem is I don't want to minimize their contribution to the level of what they look like. So I think if we were to do 100 Years of Beauty in Science and Technology, I think we'd have to rethink our format and imagine just exactly what their contributions were and how we could visualize them. Yeah, but if you have any ideas, <laughs> do write us and tell us. <laughs> As for your second idea, which I also quite like, we've been talking about doing 100 Years of beauty and sci-fi. We've worked out a couple of preliminary ideas for that. Maybe we do go back historically and say, how did people envision the, the, the future in 1910? How did they envision the future in 1920? And so on and so forth. And I think that would be a really interesting narrative. So I, if any of you like sci-fi people out there have suggestions about that, I would totally love your help. <laughs> <laughs> With the, with the, with the marine. <laughs> this is where I work. Okay, back to being bitchy. Let's see. <laughs> okay, here's another comment. So this is from Stefan Nicola. Thanks for writing, Stefan. Color film was in no way inherently racist. Photography was invented by white people and used by white people. It was made to optimize their skin without any intention of excluding anyone based on race. If color photography had been invented in Africa, it would have been made to optimize the color of their skin. In any case, the color film industry responded to consumer complaints and reformulated the chemicals in order to accommodate darker skin tones and darker colors in general. Stop making racism where there is none. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Since you posted this comment, I'm going to have to deconstruct it just a little bit. First of all, photography, like any other kind of technology, I don't think we could ever say it was purely invented by white people. And in fact, in the history of science and technology, it's those contributions from people of color and people in the so-called third world or developing world that gets completely erased when it's narrated. And you can look this up. There is a long tradition of imaging practices that help produce modern photography. What we think of as Western science is actually a collection of knowledges and practices that have been happening all over the world. So don't give white people credit where it's not due. Uh, second of all, if in this narrative it is white people forgetting about people with darker skin tones when they're um, calibrating the emulsification process for color film photography, if they're ignoring the darker skin tones because they don't have dark skin themselves, that's racism. <laughs> yes, it is true. The color industry had built into its technologies and practices um, a s strategy of calibrating the development of film to white skin. They would use something called a Shirley card, which is a picture of a white woman um, in a background and then a little color swatch, right? So that they'd have one Shirley card and they'd print a test Shirley card on their machine and try to calibrate them as closely together as possible. Uh, I think in the 70s or the 80s or something, people are like, hey, that's totally fucked up. Um, people with darker skin don't look like people when you develop pictures after this kind of calibration practice. They started introducing, as Stefan says, that is correct, uh, more multicultural uh, Shirley card. So you'll see one with a white woman, a black woman, and an Asian woman, for example. It's true that the industry had corrected a little bit. But at the same time that was happening in like broadcast journalism and on TV, people would still have stand-ins to help do the, the white balancing on film footage, right? And those stand-ins were usually like an intern or an assistant or something that was usually a white woman. So even again in motion film, a practice like this can still happen. If you think film doesn't carry with it racial meanings, then you need only look, I think, at the way we cast for film. Which actors get cast even if they are people of color? If you look at images on magazines, um, all the time we hear complaints of women getting their faces whitewashed. I'm not re putting racism where there isn't racism. I'm sorry to say, Stefan, but this world is pretty racist and everything in it carries with it racial meanings whether we like it or not. <sighs> Yikes. <laughs> I have like nothing to, else to say about that, <laughs> really. Um, yeah. <laughs> In my last video, I compared and contrasted countercultural movements between white women and black women. We got this really thoughtful and interesting response from a person named Akira Kitty Black on Facebook. I just want to say Akira Kitty Black had some disagreements with us but I love just when anybody puts a lot of thought into their response and just lets the comments become a kind of water cooler for all of us to have actually really sophisticated and interesting discussions on Facebook nonetheless. Akira writes, This is very interesting, however, I did feel edgy when he said that the hippie look is natural, earthy, and soft for the white girl. And for the black girl, her hippie era look is political. My perception is that the afro is soft, a round shape is the softest, most natural shape in existence. She is soft, earthy, and natural. The white girl hippie look is countercultural and political, unwashed, uncombed. As in previous decades, hair was set on curlers, teased or ratted into a big helmet with absolute structure, short and neat, everything in its place. The hippie hair. White and black is all about to find the perfect white bread and fluffy soap bubbles of an outdated 1950s patriarchal idea of society, family, commerce, and government created by white men to control the rest of us. So consider changing some of your perceptions of what a natural beauty is and what revolutionary beauty is. They are mutually inclusive. Okay, I think rather astutely what Akira Kitty Black is pointing out is that I've made a distinction, true or not, about the kind of politics that are embedded in these two styles. When I say that, and this is not to disagree per se with her comment, but when I say that uh, the white woman's countercultural look is soft and earthy, or it returns to an organic, mythic past, what I'm trying to point out 
is that even in the history of revolutionary politics and counterculturalism, that there has been a racial division. A lot of the women and black feminists that come out of the black power movement in the 70s and the 80s have actually plenty to say about the divisions within feminism and what they begin to articulate as white feminism. Yes, these are two political looks, grappling on to the signifiers of the natural. But black women had so much more to lose when it comes to their hair and their styling. Really, in the grand scheme of it all, neither white women nor black women could afford to return to this past which didn't exist for them, nor could they have the option to return to it. I do think it's fair to say these white women who were not taking care of their hair in patriarchally mandated ways were staking it up to the patriarchy, and that that in and of itself is a revolutionary act. But we have to interrogate feminism even still as having an intersectional dimension that often black women were left out of the conversations um, on those college campuses, right? Often their needs were deprioritized in the face of all women's needs, right? So you can think of this like hashtag all lives matter movement thing as being continuous with that project. So, well, I don't know what else to say about that. There are plenty of women and women of color out there that are already saying all of this and um, saying it better than I could. But we should just acknowledge through these two different styles, I do think we see two political ideologies that both fall under the category of radical feminism. Um, okay, so, well, you might have noticed we've been a little MIA lately, but you can expect a lot more 100 Years of Beauty videos, more research videos, and this little weekly mailbag thing um, as we gear up into full on 100 Years of Beauty mode. I guess I should also say, you guys should comment more, and you should comment in this thread. And we'd love to just start a dialogue with you guys. I just want to give a shout out to the 100 Years of Beauty fan club. You guys are so sweet, and I love getting little pings from you all on Twitter. So if you don't follow them, you should. It's just the 100 YOB fan club on Twitter.